Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, my name is Kristen Leach, and I'm part of Second Generation Seeds, and I'm going to present a little this morning uh, in conjunction with Emily Yao, who's one of our team members, and Mario Lissadeno, who's going to speak a little bit about her experience having cooperatives. And so I'll introduce them later, but I wanted to give just a sort of brief overview of like what we are as a seed entity and kind of like what is motivating us to be this weird thing that we're doing. Um, and so I just wanted to first ground us in the fact that, you know, for us, like a lot of our motivation is really rooted in like, the fabric of historic cooperative organizing and the different levels of, you know, informal networks and mutual aid and types of community organizing beyond just like the formal business entity that we are. Um, and just remind us too of just kind of like the richness of what communities have contributed to this idea of collective organizing, especially as it relates to agriculture. So this is a picture of uh, Pachapa Camp, which was like the first kind of Korean American community hub. Uh, and in 1905, there was a lot of Korean American sort of mutual aid networks that developed. Um, and so in part, Pachapa Camp, like it was a farm worker community uh, in Riverside. And so it functioned in a variety of ways to be really vertically integrated and in the types of community services it provided. So it was about dealing with housing and labor contracting. There was community lending. Uh, so addressing like a lot of needs that were um, relevant to Korean Americans. One, because most of Korean immigration away from the Korean Peninsula was informed by Japanese occupation and the violence at that time. Two, upon arriving in places like the US and parts of the Yucatan and Hawaii, um, you know, you're met with both anti-Asian sentiment growing uh, within this country, and also the fact that most labor contracting that was happening by the time Koreans were arriving was really controlled by Japanese labor contractors. So it's to also just say that a lot of when we look at cooperatives, it's both to try to reclaim power from really inequitable systems, but also to build alternate forms of power that have nothing to do with those systems. Uh, and just acknowledging that I think what a lot of our communities knew is that a lot of those systems are rigged in ways that don't benefit us and look to keep us exploited. Um, and so that's really kind of what we're rooted in. In a contemporary space, Korean Women Peasants Association and kind of like the struggles in lots of parts of Asia and the rest of the world against globalization was also kind of what we're really rooted in like I'm someone who's an adolescent in the 90s and so my whole sort of political education was really oriented like in this flashpoint about neoliberalism the green revolution and how it played out kind of continually in places like Korea so just for me this is a way to like calm my nerves and ground myself in just the wisdom of what who I see myself as accountable to and who, if I succeed in like what my aspirations are, I can find myself kind of woven into the fabric of what they created. And this is just a very short list and an overview of some things that document cooperative development by Asian American communities in California. So it covers things from the Palo Verde phase, dry farming collective that was in Southern California that just recently kind of lost its last remaining tenant uh, due to reclamation by I think the national parks, um, Punjabi American fruit growers cooperatives and kind of their role in citrus and almond production in California, um, Filipino farm worker unions up and down the West Coast. So this is, of course, by no means exhaustive, but just to say, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> and what we're doing isn't novel, uh, even though sometimes it feels like we're being told it is. So going back to this idea of like just the ways that that system has been skewed um, and a little bit actually kind of related to the point that Owen made when you look at that breakdown of rural and urban spaces and where you find BIPOC communities being able to grow their own food. Um, this is just three milestones in terms of history for this country that kind of excluded Asian communities in various forms. And there's always been this precarious and tenuous balance over like a century and a half of needing both an exploitable workforce, uh, the impact on like people's ancestral lands being exploited too in service of uh, you know the developing global north, um, with also just wanting to really restrict the types of power that was being built. 
And so you have these different acts, you know, in the early part of uh, mid part of the 1800s, you have like three quarters of the agricultural workforce in California being Chinese, right? People have stayed after the railroad, uh, weren't getting jobs in mines, and so transitioned to agriculture, large reclamation projects, uh, Sacramento, basically everywhere in California that became an agricultural hub was really built on Chinese labor in those days. Uh, so that as you see Chinese exclusion start to kick in, you have that labor pool pulling from other groups, right? So that's when you start to see other Asian Americans immigrating, filling that void. Um, then of course you get to like kind of the most substantial thing that I think everybody does know of, which is Japanese internment. This is Japanese American farmers in San Diego. So right outside of the Bay Area, uh, transplanting celery. And so if there's any, misconception about what internment served to function for. This pretty much can clarify it, where it really establishes like a land-based motive for the incarceration of Japanese Americans. There's surveys you can see from the USDA in cooperation with the FBI and CIA. Now I know this is sounding like where I put my tinfoil hat on, but it's all <laughs> <laughs> documented on paper at this point. Uh, and you have things like you see the Salinas Vegetable Grower Shipper Association, Lots of agricultural associations at that time banded together. These were functioning as cooperatives, right? But they locked out different communities from participating in those economies. So that just, I mean, I don't want to read it out loud. You can read it, but it's very explicit that link of disenfranchisement and internment as a land grab. So even though you see the contributions that Japanese Americans made and the fact that they sort of organized very uniquely within the United States sort of agricultural system to gain a truly substantive power in terms of land ownership and the amount of farm land leases they held. And once that balance started to be skewed, there's a recalibration, right? That happens to like this massive federal order. Uh, and just to say too, in retrospect, not one single Japanese American person can actually charge with espionage during that entire time, right? We also want to talk about the economic outcomes of decisions like that because people were mostly uh, dispossessed of their land leading up to harvest. So you have both like removal of like between 40 and 80 percent of production, like whether that's 40 percent of strawberries, up to 80 percent of snap beans and celery, specialty crop production. So in terms of the economy of it, it created this boom, right? And then you have the ways that those different things kind of conspire together. So the FSA subsidized a lot of white farmers to take over that land. They subsidized like several years to kind of like figure out how to scale, meet the labor needs to produce on that land. Meanwhile, causing like food time shortages that affected most Americans at that time, really for the benefit of a very narrow group of like increasingly consolidated like white growers. So this also leads to those wartime shortages, right? It leads to the idea of the food markets. Entirely to try to promote citizens to start consuming in the void of what was left by removing Japanese Americans from the land. You also have a program called uh, Victory Vacations, where labor was replaced by white high school students, right? So Santa Clara Valley. So Aside from just trying to make everyone have a really uncomfortable Saturday morning, um, <laughs> why am I bringing this up? It's because when we talk to growers and the things that we're addressing, I think sometimes there just isn't this immediate lens that where we look at land access and how it affects things. But land access, land tenure, and the stability of those things informs everything. It informs all of like the economic margins, um, just capability to kind of like perceive yourself having a long horizon, investing in these seed systems. And I think just due to, yeah, the majority of our growers and like Asian American communities on land, we're tenant farmers, we're on like year to year leases many times, and we're on very small parcels of land in the big scheme of things, right? So with those things, like when we talk about just like mobilizing our communities, there is a level, there's a barrier to buy-in just because of the enormous economic risk um, and asking people to invest in this, yeah, this long-term vision 
but why do you invest in a long-term vision when you don't know if you're going to be somewhere from one year to the next, right? And so I think those were just some of the things that are in this kind of weird pool of issues that we had to address with, yeah, seed economics being kind of one, one piece of it. So we do a similar model to Owen. I'm going to just I don't want to keep looking at that. Um, we do a similar model to Owen, and that's in part because of, yeah, that small footprint that a lot of our farmers get to kind of exist within. For me, I was coming from a background of doing uh, full sale contracts and seed trials, field trials for other seed companies. Um, so just like, you know, for me, the concern was, yeah, both the economic pressures where most producers are growing things like strawberry, right? high value things that enable you to stay on really expensive land leases in really expensive areas. Um, so with the seed economics being so murky, uh, it's really hard to make a compelling case how that's gonna replace high-end kind of specialty crop production on these lands. Um, so that 50-50 margin is helpful. So the example that is very easy to break that down from a pound of lettuce, for us, you get $70 a pound. To produce one pound of lettuce seed, we estimate to put 40 plants, keep 40 plants in the field, right? Now you look at just like head lettuce, at a market, I'm getting 250 a head for that lettuce. So right away, it's a wash, you're operating in the red. Not only that, but figure 45, 60 days, I'm harvesting that head lettuce at 250 a head rather than leaving that 250 ahead in the field for an additional like three months to make sure that seed. So it's just a non-starter, right? And then given the small footprint, you can't scale that in any meaningful way where then those numbers start to make sense because there's an efficiency too if you can start producing larger scales of that wholesale per pound price, right? But that is really just off the table. The other concern for me was just like on the back end, what's happening to like our stock seed and the genetic resources behind all of these crop varieties. So that seed industry consolidation also feeds into sort of like evolutionary potentially dead ends and bottlenecks. Because like for us with Asian specialty crops, we get like one variety, right? Like when I was looking for Korean produce, I was like, oh, there's a Korean soybean and there's one Korean perilla. But really those crops are like so dynamic and so complex and this is where it also links back to like our solidarity networks in places like Korea, where you see the activities of like global seed industry and just global agriculture in general, affecting like the maintenance and preservation of like crop wild species and kind of germplasm and biodiversity in those places. So a lot of my concern was one, seed economics to some extent, but just what's happening to like a lot of our really beloved and cherished crops in terms of like having as much genetic buffer to kind of like look for adaptation and continued improvement and just sheer development. And that development is really curated and held, right, by a very narrow set of interests. So to me, that 50-50 split also, you know, say that one pound of lettuce seed, right, that's probably no less than like 800 seed packets. We sell a package for $4, <coughs> you split that, right? So suddenly the economics make more sense. So then if that in that same footprint of growing that pound of lettuce, it also gives you room to grow a bigger population, looking at selection and improvement, it subsidizes a little bit of the research and development that I think our farms aren't getting a lot of room to do. So the genetic erosion piece is also kind of a significant part of that. So these are our seed packets uh, designed by Emily Yao right here. Uh, so we started organizing collectively so not just in terms of being like a, essentially what functions as a marketing cooperative, but also just trying to have some level of what Owen called spokes and hubs, but in a really dynamic nonlinear way where also things get resourced leading out from a central hub. And so one of our team members, Ari Delenia, who has Kamayan Farm in, in Washington, uh, brought us this from another type of cooperative farm project in Western Washington. Uh, just about governance, because that was a big piece for us, and that's the pieces that we're really chewing on actively. And so just to acknowledge, too, like, we're very new to this, like, second generation started as a seed line and a collection within Kitazawa. You know, we were looking to grow, like, a growers collaborative as part of that. Uh, and once Kitazawa was sold to True Leaf uh, last year, we ended up just disconnecting and deciding to try to do something 
different and on our own terms. Um, so this was brought to us by Ari just as kind of a, a, a way to visualize it. And it seemed helpful as people were exploring it just because it's structured and visually compelling. So for us, we ended up breaking up into like five or four, <laughs> four focus committees, crop development, internal grower capacity, education and organizing and communications. And so our group of six uh, growers and then kind of our expanding network uh, works, you have an option to kind of like be funneled into any or all of those committees. And then kind of going back to Ari's chart here, we think of like who's bottom lining it, who's working collectively to like kind of move priorities forward, and then who are we consulting in the process and who are we accountable in terms of our outcomes. And so on the top, you see like each of those committees, that's like an output. So crop development, we're responsible for like the commercial seed line, curating that catalog, seed campus, like hosting field days, doing kind of like external facing education. Uh, internal grower capacity, we're producing grower resources. So trying to develop better technical guides for Asian crops uh, that is rooted in Asian perspectives. We have a group called Seed Stewards, which is our education program. Uh, and then working along these pieces of shared marketing and external narrative building uh, in terms of just like trying to strengthen market channels and economies for the small growers that both work with us to grow seed, but then who are growing our seed by fresh market producers producing Asian crops. The little buckets below are just things that we resource to get to those outcomes. So this is kind of like areas on the back end and internal organizing that we see as really critical to resource and to really uh, Build. And if those things are flourishing, then we see a strengthening of those outcomes. So with building our seed catalog, we, and perhaps I should take responsibility of being like very slow and very cautious with building that catalog because we want to, yeah, still adhere to some guys and just like how stable it is, how meaningful is it for those communities and really get into some of like being able to articulate a clear sense of how communities benefit from it. And so these are all the bottom line things that our projects we work on and things that we invest in, in order to kind of like get to our end goals. So that's, yeah, different models of participatory research and our community partnerships, types of events, um, creating templates. We started a fellowship this year to, again, like just subsidize for growers a little bit of just the back end like hit you take if you're transitioning or trying to integrate seed production within fresh market growing. Uh, and then building out like our trials uh, and breeding network essentially to be able to hold all of these questions. Um, and I'll just say too that, you know, we're this very new company, we have like a catalog that's only like 15 varieties, right? And that's even double from last year. Um, and we really did start like in 2020, my farm got an emergency COVID relief grant actually from an organization where Ayla works for. So we got $10,000. We ended up piloting like a 35 family um, free CSA box. And we decided to use that CSA box to convene um, Vietnamese, Filipino, and Korean families because we already had that network in place from some third world resistance organizing. Emily created coloring books and we tried to use like the CSA box format to, to bring communities into conversations about seed stewardship. So for like some months, they got a box that was nothing but like six varieties of perilla. I just like, <laughs> and where we get complaints from growers, they're like, we gave two bunches of this herb and people are like ready to riot basically because they think it's too much herbs. And for us, we're like, oh, we just gave someone like six pounds of herbs. But it was like delightful because we, we supplemented that with programming and things that just like were specific to time and place of people being cooped up. So we just created a mechanism to kind of like catalyze conversations within families um, about cultural food waste. And it was validating because at a time when CSA had really felt like it got away from a lot of small producers, um, we did we were able to do something that like did the opposite of all of the momentum as where things were being carried, right? It was like less convenient. It wasn't just uh, cherry picking exactly what you wanted when you wanted it. It was like, we're gonna just give you whatever we have, like breeding lines of squash, lots of herbs, um, but we're gonna just like, and we're gonna ask that you like spend a lot of time together as a family talking about these things. So it was like not convenient. It wasn't expedient. <laughs> it was like asking you to like slow down. Um, 
So again, yeah, very specific, but I mean, that ended up leading the way for us to really uh, subsidize a lot of this through philanthropic funds. So when we built out and kind of brought five other people onto that team, it was because of a grant where we could like pay each person essentially as a subcontractor. I and mean, we could, we afforded to pay everybody like $10,000 essentially as like a fellow of this program. And so a lot of our programs like look to kind of all those four buckets, like try to make it as much of a overlapping Venn diagram as possible. So we just look for all those points of intersection. So this is like from a chili pepper event we did this summer where we're trying to stabilize like a bunch of Korean peppers within different hybrid lines because there's like an issue of legacies of cytoplasmic male sterility in terms of Korean pepper germplasm. So we're trying to stabilize a bunch of open pollinated varieties. We hosted a chili pepper event. Uh, so again, just trying to think of all these ways that we're both building bridges, having building understanding within our communities. Those communities are helping to inform like our breeding and selection. And then it's also helping us to essentially develop like every type of template we need to like steward seeds properly. So like we're having like community informed phenotyping protocol essentially. And so this is from our seed stewards on some of our materials. Um, yeah, again, like hosting events, like cook-alongs, um, just kind of like in-person community events. And that's both a way that our seed stewards have like connects people across the country and in different remote regions. Um, and also a way that like it ties into some of the marketing and things we're trying to figure out for farmers in terms of creating programming that's engaging for consumers there's the consumers who are buying our seed and there's their consumers. And we're trying to kind of bridge all of those different links in that kind of chain. Um, and so by us creating programming, it's like when someone says, oh, my CSA is complaining, they got two bunches of Perilla. Uh, oh, great. We'll organize a cook along. We'll help you sell like more moderate wholesale amounts of that and like run up to this event. And then we'll have this so that people are just basically begging you for more Perilla through the year because now they have a way of pickling it and preserving it and getting excited about it. And then this is uh, some of the coloring books and materials that we have, thanks to Emily, where again, it's like both synthesizing some of the sort of community organizing we're doing and trying to create some sort of materials uh, kind of moving forward that help build to these external narratives and the stories that surround our crops, uh, understanding and starting to differentiate and understanding more of the genetic complexity within crop species that are sort of flattened once it kind of enters like US mindset. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to end it here just because it's a perfect segue for you to admire the work of Emily Yao. <laughs> um, and I'll just say, yeah, Emily was someone I met years ago and is both like a talented artist and designer, but also like in a lot of early conversations, she has this like architectural thinking around relationships and kind of like uh, user engagement, I guess, so to speak. So when we realized we wanted to be more than just the commercial seed entity, we wanted to think of like being a really kind of living resource to like farmers and our Asian American communities. Uh, Emily was someone who was like just so integral in like a lot of those conversations. Um, so I'll you can go on. <laughs> yeah, I can uh definitely can I don't care. <laughs> um nice to meet you guys. Uh yeah, I've been really honored to be able to work on this um, in part with this community, with Kristen. Um, I actually am uh, one of the non-growers in this space and I'm very bad at growing too, but I, I love food and I love learning. And so I think I can represent that like community side of it, which you need supply and demand. Um, and I, I guess like a little bit of background is other than an illustration, my, my um, day job is also being a user experience researcher or design uh, strategist. And all this means is like we basically take ways of understanding people, what they need, where they are, uh, what their motivations are, and bringing that into actually designing, you know, new solutions, new products, new organizations. And, you know, like when we think about the crop breeding process and seed, seed preservation, like all of this is through community participatory research, right? Like even kind of the things that you see, like the tastes, those are all like a human perspectives, like all the usages that you want um, with gorilla and whatnot, 
Um, so I, I think that what's really interesting about this project is it <coughs> so many, so many stakeholders and communities. Um, you have the growers, you have uh, the, the people who want to eat food, the general community. You also have chefs, including home chefs that like are making the food. You also have other community organizations that are telling and preserving the stories, doing the food and community justice work mm -hmm. in these um, uh, with different communities. But even within those groups, you have a lot of diversity. Within the growers, you have people who actually like have years of experience of, of not only farming, but also uh, like breeding, right? You have farmers who can grow, but they don't have experience doing trials. And you have those who are really aspirational farmers or home growers who don't <laughs> have that expertise, right? And even within the community, like on our side, there's so many different Asian American diaspora communities. Not only that, but you have people like me who, uh, I, I look up recipes by Googling in English, right? I have this distance uh, from, from my own culture. Um, and then you have the aunties, you know, the grandmas who like have this like tighter cultural knowledge as, as well. And so how do you serve different communities or bring them together? Uh, and so it's really, really fun. And as you can tell, like to, to think about all of this, like bridging and connecting and and also being strategic because you can't satisfy everyone. So where do you start? Who do you start with? Um, and I think that the, in the three years that I've participated and supported in this, every year we're experimenting. We're experimenting with what we think like the, the focus should be in terms of our resources. Um, and, and we're experimenting with how we want to bring community together. Uh, so from, from this CSA box with, with different uh, select families that could actually have this, even online FaceTime together, there was this accountability, a feeling of a larger family. The next year when, with the pandemic, we moved towards a model that was like trying to scale a lot of this like education. We did more polished YouTube videos. We were on this, this platform called Mighty Networks, which basically we had imagined like, oh, everybody's going to be, you know, adding in comments, adding in questions, adding in perspectives, but it was silent. <laughs> you know, like we saw in the data, people were logging in, watching things, but everyone was like too timid to, to talk, right? And we're like, oh, okay, we need, we need to change it up. So then we changed it up to like these monthly pot potlucks that were less intimidating and could bring people together. But you know what? The pandemic's fading. People don't want to be on the computer anymore. And so then this year we started to do more in-person events. And that has been like really resonating um, because I, I think that like what I am learning, uh, what this larger kind of cultural community needs is I, I so behavior change, like this world that that a second generation sees is trying to build this is super beautiful. It's this world where you can have access to any variety of food that's like also made with integrity. We're very, very far away from it, right? And there's like, even I'm very lucky to have access to farmers being in the Bay Area to have like a taste of it. So knowing that behavior change and like getting there is really difficult. What we can offer is like pockets of enchantment to get like a taste of what that world could feel like. It's not every day, but then once you have a taste, you, you get more people to like want to experience that more. And so I think those cooking perilla events, like stuff like that, where we really collectively hype up this experience, this prop, um, yeah, th that has been really resonating and it also shines light to the farmers that are actually growing this to, the people who are actually telling these stories too. Yeah, I just felt like Emily it was like exciting to invite you here just because I remember like for years, Jamie from Quail Seeds would talk about like her experience in the salmon industry and like a campaign. And it's exactly that. It was about like behavior changes, like mindset changes around farm and wild salmon. And it just felt like hearing that at former seed summits, I was like, oh, there's like a piece here that we could expand into a whole day because that's like the piece maybe is all like 
seed geeks isn't top of mind, but like was so valuable. And I just feel like having Emily even like repeat back, like, what are you hearing in this like weird tirade about plant genetics has been like super helpful to just inform like what's digestible and how do you create, you know, like when the problems are massive and also multifaceted, it's like, how do you just figure out like not to diminish any of it, but you need to bring some things to be kind of top of the pile and you need to just like work around it on this time frame of just being like, what are the bites we can take a chunk out of right now? And I think that that's just been super helpful. And I think, yeah, Jamie, I just wanted to, you had really inspired that because yeah. your talk of that campaign stuck with me like all these years. Um, the other person that I roped into this is Mariela right here, who has like a lot of background in cooperative uh, just businesses and models. I'll say personally, Mariela is like always the person in a lot of meetings who's like my lifeline where I'm like, oh, like I trust Mariela will like say the thing that needs to be said or just like bring up a different perspective um, and is also like currently in working in like non-extractive ways to like invest in community projects too and so it's coming from like having a foot in a lot of worlds that I think yeah as Owen said like we're anti-capitalist like trying to like be really overtly capitalist um, and I think when there's like an internal conflict there's a murkiness and sometimes like a failure of strategy then because the discomfort is makes it just you just act weird or i i just act weird i guess i should say uh and so i think like mariella is someone who i like always appreciate like her insights and things and i'll just trade you i'll what sit I, over there what do you want to say <laughs> <laughs> well i tell mariella like sometimes because mariella has also given me some tough love of like <laughs> there's good and bad ways of forming cooperatives and then you listen to them all i was like oh I think I'm on the bad track. <laughs> um, so all right. Yeah. yeah, thanks. It's a good prompt. Hi, everybody. Uh, Maria Sereno. Um, yeah, just to share, like, my background is probably more on the economic development <coughs> side and the capital side, um, but also, like, deeply believe in shared ownership and shared wealth building, which is what often crosses me back into kind of co-op spaces or collective spaces. I'm also part of a collective myself. Um, yeah, and I think some of the things that uh, Chris and I have talked about over the years is I feel like there's, I'm going to put things into three buckets of kind of co-op development. There's the, the piece that like that. Okay, oh, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, oh, okay. I think you're good oh, now. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Um, ooh. So we got a new test. Am I just talking now? Okay, I can't hear myself. That's nice. Hey, you're real. So, so, anyway, so yeah, so I think like part of what brings things together functionally in the middle is like when you really think about like what your purpose is of becoming a cooperative, creating a cooperative, right? And so I think for, for me and my work, it's been about wealth building, right? And so I think often when you think about the ideology, some folks lose touch with what the wealth building piece is and what does it really mean to do business planning in a way that makes that achievable. Um, and I think the other piece of it is like, once you start thinking about that, 
there's a reality that all the values that you hold may not be able to also be present in the business model that you have, or they might not be present at the same, with the same weight, right? So I think a lot about what I think about is like when folks are thinking about co-ops of any space in food is like, what is your ultimate value? And how do you, how do you map that back to your like business plan, right? Um, I think it is, I think about this a lot in food because it is already a space that's so extracted from that if you're trying to make money in that space, and I don't mean like, you know, crazy, like Jeff Bezos money, I mean, just like money to sustain yourself. It's a really small margin. Like there isn't a business in food that has like a very significant margin, right? So you're talking about like 5% to 15, and that's not, that's not a lot of spread, which means that you may not always like, and I don't, I, I feel like I'm always like bursting bubbles, but you may not be able to like weigh all your values in the same way, right? Or at least not from the get-go. And so I think it's always really important to think about like what the first thing you're trying to address and how to then as you grow, also bring all the other things at the same time, right? So I think about this, for example, in like grocery, right? Um, there's the like food accessibility to communities of color, right? That's been the space that I've been for a long time in food access. There's also the living wages for workers in spaces and then there's sourcing, right? Like what does like equitable sourcing mean? And I think that if you're not doing kind of like a big box grocery, if you're like in a small footprint, you're with a small team, doing all those three things at the same time with the same space means that you're not doing any of them well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm talking about the like finance side of it, right? So I, I guess what I like, Part of what we talk a lot about is like, how do you bring together like the beautiful vision of cooperativism and what it really means to take care of your community with like the practicality of your business model and like, how do you make enough money to sustain yourself and sustain your community? Um, and so like, that's that's the piece that I always like to talk to folks about is just like this, there's the, there's ideology, there's governance, but there also has to be a touch point back to like the wealth building part because all of us are trying to sustain ourselves in a system that is not necessarily set up to work for us, right? Um, and I think the, the other side of this too that I like often think about in kind of across these spaces is the kinds of cooperative structures that folks want to be in because they're not all equal, right? So like I remember when I was first learning about co-ops, um, like the like shining star was like Mondragon in Spain, right? Like, I don't know, do you guys know when they're going co-ops? Some folks, okay, right. So it's like the biggest co-op in the world. It's like a hundred and something cooperatives of cooperatives of cooperatives. They have their own university, their own healthcare, um, their own R&D department. They're the fourth largest electrodomestic manufacturer in the EU. Like it's huge, right? And it started with like one industrial production co-op in the fifties and some priest, I think Mendelianda. Um, and so like, and so that's the vision of that. If you go to Mondragon and you spend like a week <laughs> in the businesses, they are like hyper capitalist, like corporate business structures. Like the vision that we're fed here around like the history and this like nice priest who organized factory workers, like that is not what they are today. Like they have like straight up corporate board meetings where they're like talking about other electrodomestic makers and how to destroy them and how to like, yeah, like how to like, you know, take over factories in Brazil where they have, they'll have like lower cost of production there. And like those folks are a part of the co-ops, but like it means that their community can like make money. And then you have like young executives who actually have like no context of cooperativism. They're just like living in a corporate structure that like happens to be part of a co-op, but that works for them. Right. And what that's meant is that this entire city of Mondragon, like the average retirement age is like 56 or something like that. Uh, again, they have their own healthcare, their own university, like all these systems, and that's how they've how they flourished, right? And then there's like Bay Area co-ops that are hyper centralized, where they have like one central body that's making all decisions around how they invest into other co-ops, and then they have folks who are just kind of like cool, we're working, and we have like good jobs, right? Like we're part. So I think like I thrive in figuring out the nitty gritty of these business things that often when I am in spaces where like I share a lot of solidarity in, we like don't get into. Um, and so I think my invitation is to think about like all the things that you value and all these conversations that you're having around like ecology and shared wealth and, and also think about how do you get there from a practical perspective? Because it's really defeating when you've thought about all these things, but then the business tanks in mm -hmm. two years. Um, and so if you really want to kind of see those values come to fruition, you also have to pay attention to how the business makes money and make some 
you know, just thoughtful decisions about how you get there and the values that you're infusing in the business, like immediately from day one, like things that are non-starters if they don't happen and the things that you might want to work up to. Yeah, that's my diatribe about co-ops. <laughs> cool.